Thank you, thank you. Come on, sometimes you just need a few more moments, don't you? Amen. Thank you, choir. Thank you, worship team. Well, good morning, everyone. Are you well? Come on, it's good. Will you take a couple more minutes to soak? Sometimes you need it on a Sunday morning, don't you? I hope you're doing well today. For those I don't know, my name is Nick. I'm a student pastor here. We just want to welcome you. It's good to see you today. Have you had an incredible week? Have you? Are you well? Come on, we're doing well. Jesus is here. I hope you've had a great week. I hope you had a wonderful time last week. I hope your team brought home a trophy. Any uh, Kansas City Chiefs fans in the room? Are you here? Feeling it a little bit? We didn't have any Eagles playing. We didn't have any uh, Steelers playing, but that's okay. Maybe you just watched the game, had a great time. We had a really great time here with our students. We had a Super Bowl party that went down last Sunday, and we don't really care how the game goes. We just have a really good time. We started by playing two hours straight of flag football together. <laughs> which is always a risk with students. We were like, we told them beforehand, just stretch really well. Nobody get injured. Do not hurt yourself. This is like a verbal waiver that we're not responsible for anything that happens to you, right? We had a really great time. No injuries, but we had a great time with over 100, over 100 middle school, high school, and college age students with us. Come on, it was exciting. An incredible way to celebrate and just spend some time together on a day that some people are really into, some people are less so. But I want to take a moment before we really begin today in the message and tell you about something that's coming up right around the corner. If you have a student who's in middle school or in high school, we have our annual district youth convention coming up in April. Really exciting. We're going to be converging together, our whole group converging on the Giant Center in Hershey for this annual convention with thousands of other youth to worship together, to learn together, to grow close together. It's an incredible moment. And if you have a student who's in middle school and high school, we would love for them to join us. The dates are, it's the weekend right before Easter. It's April 9, 10, and 11. We would love for your student to join us if they don't have plans. We would love for them to join us even if they do have plans. Cancel those plans. Get them plugged into Youth Convention. If you're interested, you can find everything online, clacamphill.com. We'd love to have them join us. Well, I'm excited to be with you this morning. We're in the middle of a series, a really great series that we've been in for a few weeks now. It's a series called Be. It's the name of the series. It's Be. And we're talking all about being the people Jesus is calling us to be. This is week four today. A few weeks ago, we talked all about what it means to be because we, uh, we really know, I hope you know, we all know that there's so many voices out there. There are a lot of opinions out there. Everyone's sharing theirs on social media or on the internet. There's free access to what everyone else thinks about who you should be, who I should be, who we should be, but we want to know what Jesus thinks, amen? This is what this series is all about, learning who Jesus is calling us to be. What kind of people do we want to be because of what Jesus says? We started this series by talking about how God calls us to be people who are equipped. Week after that, we talked about being available. Last week, Pastor Shane shared God's call to be purposeful. And this morning, we're going to talk about the natural next step, the outflowing. If we're going to become all these things Jesus wants us to be, we believe this morning God is calling us to be courageous, to be courageous, as we're talking about this morning. And we all love that idea, maybe. I think probably everyone in the room loves the idea of being courageous, right? Maybe we idolize those moments where somebody stepped out in boldness or in faith, stepped out with courage. Maybe even the moments in your timeline of history that you're remembering the highlights of a moment where I just felt courage come over me and I took the step that I knew I needed to take. We all love the idea of being courageous. It comes all across any form of art and media. Courageous stories keep coming across, right? Your, your watch list on Netflix, everything that you'll see, it's always a story worth telling is a story that took some courage, right? We love the idea of being courageous. I love the idea of being courageous. One of my favorite things in the world is to spend my time watching documentaries, which to some of you sounds like horribly boring. You're like, that sounds terrible. I love watching a good documentary about somebody who took a bold step, who took a leap of faith, and they made a difference. Just the small act of stepping out in courage made the difference. I just remember, uh, I just recently watched one of, it's probably now one of my favorite, my favorite movies. It's, one of the, it's a true classic. I think it's one of those classic, uh, even war films that have now come out over the last few years. One of my favorite movies now, it's a movie called Dunkirk. I don't know if you're familiar with this film. You may have seen it, maybe not, maybe. Uh, it's a real classic by now. 
I really love it. I remember watching it just recently because I'm so moved by the story of Gun- Dunkirk. And it's a historical setting. This is historical. Maybe you know the history book or you've seen the movie. This is a story of courage from not just people who are supposed to be on the front lines of battle, but courage by some people who are like, I was never a part of what was happening here, but it took a step of courage to get involved because I knew they needed to. The story of Dunkirk, if you're not familiar, is a story documenting the Battle of Dunkirk, where in World War II, in 1940, in Dunkirk, France, you had 400,000 allied forces pushed against the beach at Dunkirk, completely surrounded by the enemy with no escape. There was absolutely no way off the beach, All the soldiers could do was stand there and watch planes fly overhead as they bombed them or starved them out. The enemy forces simply stopped and waited and decided, hey, we'll just take our time. And 400,000 soldiers are standing on the beach with no hope in sight. The whole country of Britain took up, and this isn't a part of the movie, but this is the Jesus behind it all. They took up a full day of prayer and fasting when the news came to them the soldier was stuck and a few civilians and when I say few I mean hundreds of civilians took a step of courage to say we have a way to get to these soldiers they jumped in their civilian boats and traveled across the channel to rescue soldiers off the beach not knowing if their craft would even make it across the water or what they were going to face when they hit the beach they decided it's worth it and over the course of a couple days 330,000 soldiers were rescued from the beach of Dunkirk. Spoiler alert, if you haven't seen the film, come on, I don't know where you've been. You have to have seen it by now if you're going to see it. 330,000 soldiers rescued because of just one act of courage by civilians who had no idea what to anticipate on the other side of the water. But they decided, hey, I have to do something. And the, the... The story has been remembered and documented as the miracle of Dunkirk to this day. And it all stemmed from a small act of courage of civilians deciding, I gotta do something. I remember just watching this movie recently and you know the credits roll and you're like, wow, that was that moves me. And I kinda like kinda step back and realize what I'm doing. I was just sitting on the couch, like slouching there. I got like crumbs down here. I was like, oh. We all like the idea of living a life that's courageous, don't we? And sometimes we've got to look around and be like, I don't know, am I actually doing anything? You feel a little bit bad about your life and what you've been up to whenever you watch a movie like Dunkirk. We all love the idea of courage, don't we? We love the idea of what if I stepped out? What if I decided that there was something that needed to change, something that needed to happen, and I take the step of faith to see it come through? What if I listened to what Jesus was telling me and I stepped out of my comfort zone because I know that he has incredible things on the other side? This morning, this is what we want to talk about. Not just how, what a great idea it would be if we were people who are courageous, but I want to actually, I want to actually relate to us. I really believe that Jesus is calling us. It's a part of following Jesus to live a life that's full of courage, full of boldness, that's willing to step out of our comfort zone because there are things that are waiting for us on the other side. And it isn't just stories in pop culture, I think, that connect to us. We see moments of courage or boldness. I think maybe when it even comes to the Bible, the stories that stick with us are the epic tales, right? Maybe even more, like if I asked you to like quote to me Romans 3, most of you'd be like, I have no idea. 2 Timothy 2, I, yeah, it's some stuff about Jesus probably. But if I was like, tell me about David and Goliath, somebody's gonna tell me all about it. Or I said, tell me about Noah's Ark, where no one believed in the guy, but he knew what God called him to do, so he stepped out in courage. You'd be like, I know that story. It's those moments that stick with us. As we talk about courage today, I want to use a story, an example that may, maybe we don't naturally turn to when we talk about moments, epic moments of courage and boldness. But I think for us, it's foundational because it shows us how courage actually doesn't begin in this grand movie scale experience. Courage actually starts in the small things and God uses that small moment or that small decision to expand what we could ever expect, right? If you've got a Bible, would you turn with me? We're going to go to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3 is going to be our case study this morning. And As you're on your way there, would you stand with me? We have a tradition of standing as we read together. Would you stand with me? We're going to Acts chapter 3, starting in verse 1. There's this encounter to set the stage here. This is just a few days after Jesus is gone. He's ascended to heaven. 
He died, rose again. He stayed with his apostles for a while, taught them, processed with them, and they said, hey, here's the keys to the kingdom. See you later. And he leaves. He goes up to heaven, brings the Holy Spirit down to them, and now the apostles are just living out their everyday life. But they're living out their everyday life with the Holy Spirit giving them courage and giving them boldness to do the impossible. Here's what we pick up in verse 1. Verse 1 says, Peter and John, apostles, went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the 3 o'clock prayer service. And as they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called the beautiful gate. It's a good name for a gate. If you're going to name a gate, call it beautiful. So he could beg from the people going into the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. Peter and John looked at him intently, and Peter said, look at us. The lame man looked at them eagerly, expecting some money, but Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up, stood on his feet, and began to walk. Then walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple with them. All the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. And when they realized he was the lame beggar, they were absolutely astounded. They all rushed out in amazement to Solomon's colonnade, where the man was holding tightly to Peter and John. If we were to read on, we see it doesn't just end there. Through this one healing moment, crowds gather, and Peter has an opportunity to speak to thousands. Tell them the gospel message. Tell them about who Jesus is, what it means for all the Jews that are in attendance, and he calls them to repentance. Come on, be a part of this community. Jesus has a new way for us, and we actually learn that they add to the number of Christians at the time all the way up to 5,000. They added a droves of people coming to know Jesus, but as is tradition, there are some people in the crowd who don't really like what they're saying. They were like, why are they talking about Jesus all this time? Pharisees, Sadducees in the crowd, they say, we've got to put a stop to this. The next day they bring them in, and they have a whole council meeting telling Peter and John, you can't do that anymore. And I want to pick up with a verse that I think is so important for us. After such an incredible encounter, where God multiplies what they could naturally do, chapter 4, verse 13, turn the page and read that with me. The most powerful and impactful moment in this encounter, I believe. Chapter 4, verse 13. After this whole encounter, and they decide, hey man, these guys, we don't want them to talk about Jesus anymore. Here's what they say in verse 13. The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. Remember, these are fishermen, they don't have any education. They're ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures, and get this, and they also recognize them as men who had been with Jesus. We get a story of a, a courageous encounter. It started with a little bit of courage, a simple conversation, but God used it to expand the influence they could have. I don't know if you're like me, I would love the idea about having highlights of courage throughout my life, but I don't want just to have like, hey, there were three times where I really stepped out. I want to live a lifestyle of courage every single day using the small moments, and then I got to multiply what we can do. Are you with me? Come on, we want to pray for that. Would you pray with me? Jesus, I just asked today, Lord, would you speak to us? You call us to be courageous, and God, we might be on board. <laughs> Show us how. God, would you give us courage where we need it? God, pray that you open up your word today and you show us ways to step out, places to step out. God, make us people who are courageous and following after you. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Thank you. You can have a seat. When we talk about courage today, I want to highlight a few things, I think, for each of us when it comes to the idea of being courageous people. I want to highlight some things about what it means to be people who are courageous. I want to highlight some things that we got to remember and know about what it means to have courage. And I want to honestly, practically, talk about action steps. How do we start building? If we're like, I got I to gotta live a life more courageously because Jesus is calling me to it. How do I start? I want to talk about that today. The first thing, if you, if you were to take notes, I want to encourage you to. It's good stuff. I might say something interesting, but Jesus definitely will. So you want to write down what he's telling you. I think the first thing we want to highlight today when it talks about courage, when it comes to courage, 
is we got to recognize this first if we're going to be people who are courageous. We got to recognize that the call to follow Jesus is a call to be courageous. They're the same thing. The call to follow Jesus is a call to be courageous. To follow Jesus, not to just say, hey, yeah, I believe in Jesus, I'll sit in a pew and I'll I'll show up, I guess. But to actually follow Jesus where he's going is an immediate call to be courageous because the places Jesus was always going were places that were beyond our natural ability. The places Jesus was going, it was like he woke up every single morning. Can you imagine being a disciple of Jesus? Where you wake up, you have no idea. Jesus, what are we doing today? Oh, I don't know. We might just go talk to some Samaritans today who hate us. Why are we doing that? Oh, what are we going to do today? I don't know. We're going to get down on the boat. And in the back of his mind, he's like, there's going to be a storm. It's going to be a disaster. They're going to freak out. Imagine, Jesus walked every single day going into places that required the people following him to have courage. He was constantly looking for encounters. Like every day of Jesus' life and ministry, he's looking around for, who can I talk to today? Who's the person nobody expects me to talk to? That's the one I want to talk to. Jesus is known for speaking to crowds. He's known for debating with religious leaders on a regular basis out in the open. He walks through the desert for 40 days without any food. He sleeps in a boat in the middle of a storm. He's always talking to the uncomfortable people. If we're going to follow Jesus, actually see where he's going and walk after him, we better have some courage because it's going to get uncomfortable. We gotta understand when we begin, the call to follow Jesus, if you say, yeah, I wanna love Jesus, I wanna serve Jesus, I wanna follow him, you better be ready to be uncomfortable. And if we're gonna be successful in following where he's going, we're gonna need some courage. Jesus knew this, why is he doing all this stuff? Because he knew that the moments that require courage are opportunities for the greatest influence. If Jesus played it safe throughout his ministry, nothing would have gotten done. He, out of everyone who had the right to sit and wait and hang out and maybe throw a few teachings out there, he had the most right of anybody, but he decided, man, I got a limited amount of time. I got to get out there. And he knew that the moments that had the potential for the greatest influence came in the moments that scared him and the people around him the most. We got to ask ourselves this morning as we begin, are we really following Jesus where he's going? Maybe you've got to ask yourself, am I really following Jesus where he's going? Am I really following him out into the boat in the middle of the storm? Or do I follow him up to the edge of the beach, lie down to get a suntan? Am I following Jesus where he's going? Or am I kind of like, I'm going halfway, but don't push me, Jesus. If we're going to be people who are courageous, we've got to recognize that Jesus is calling us to a lifestyle of everyday courage. And if we respond to that call, it'll change the culture around us. It'll change the people that you encounter every single day, and it'll change the face of a planet. Jesus is calling us to live a life that's courageous. Are we going to follow him and where he's going? So we've got to understand this morning, the call to follow Jesus is a call to be courageous. And I want to talk about a few things that it means when we talk about courage. What does courage mean? I want to talk about a few things courage is not, and a few things courage definitely is that we've got to know and remember. Number one is that courage is not the absence of fear, and it's not the absence of sense either. Courage is not the absence of fear, but it's not the absence of sense. Courage requires that you're in an uncomfortable place, right? Somewhere that scares you. Courage is the decision to do it anyway. But courage isn't just doing what scares you because, I don't know, it scares me. I guess Jesus wants me to do it. There's a fine line between courage and foolishness, right? I remember in college, I had a few friends, and you always have a few friends that are normal, and then you, you always have one or two that are just wild cards. You're like, you have no idea what they're going to do today. You have no idea. But I can remember at the end of a school year in May, you know, the weather's nice. We were like, we're going to go on a little excursion. We're going to have some fun. We're going to go swimming, just kind of camp out for a couple days. And we went out to, uh, into the woods one day, and we did some cliff jumping together. Cliff jumping. Some of you are like, terrible idea already. <laughs> you, you've made a bad decision. Now, here's the thing about cliff jumping. If you've never gone... Maybe you're like, I never will. My kids will never do it. My grandkids, I'm going to tell them, hey, normally if you're going to go cliff jumping, if you're doing it in the smart way, it's a very calculated experience. 
You want to measure the depth of the water. If you know what cliff jumping is, this is, well, it's jumping off a cliff into water, which sounds bad. Hold on, just hang with me. It's a very calculated experience if you do it right. You gotta know the depth of the water. You gotta see how much room you have between the rocks where you can actually land safely in the water. You gotta make sure I don't go too high because and it doesn't matter how deep the water is, you're done for. It's a very calculated experience if done right. You want it to be essentially a diving board in nature. That's what real good cliff jumping becomes. And so we're out there, we've got it all measured out. We're intelligent people, we're figuring it all out. We're making sure we're safe. But I can remember standing at the edge of the cliff and just kind of ready to jump again and suddenly I heard something in my left ear. I heard a voice coming up from this way. He said, hey guys. And I look up to my left, I'm not lying, we're like 20 feet from the water right now, which is pretty high. But I remember looking up to my left and there was one of our wild card friends, like 15 feet higher and off to the left. Like you didn't have to even do any calculations. You knew he should not be jumping from that far and that high. What a terrible decision this man is making. Is he even an adult? These are the questions you're asking in your mind. Immediately all of our friends are like, that's a terrible, horrible idea. You're gonna maim yourself or kill yourself. There's a fine line between courage and foolishness. This was the guy who was always like, I'm down for whatever we gotta do. He, he got so much pride about like how bold and courageous he was. Like, dude, I don't know if that's courage. I think that's a little bit of foolishness. I think it's a little bit of stupidity. There's a fine line between courage and foolishness. I think it's more fine than we recognize. I think the thing that we have to ask ourselves when it comes to doing something that scares us is ask yourself about the payoff. Why am I doing it? And you'll find out if it's really worth it. Jesus always had a reason. He wasn't going out into the storm because it was fun. He had a reason. There was something he wanted to show us. There was something he wanted to teach us. There was a miracle he wanted to do. We gotta ask ourselves, to determine the line between foolishness and courage, what is the payoff? Following Jesus is doing the things that scare us because it's worth it. And I think maybe that separates us from a life of courage is that we just don't internalize or make it a part of who we are to know that like really what's beyond that scary thing on the other side is so worth it. It's so worth the, the moment of terror or feeling uncomfortable or feeling afraid. Courage is doing the things that scare us, but it's not being an idiot about it. It's not being stupid, not making a bad decision. Courage is not the absence of fear, and it's not the absence of sense, but here's what courage is. Courage is responding to Jesus no matter what it means for me. Courage is responding to Jesus no matter what it means for me. Sometimes stepping out in courage, we often think of something that's gonna benefit us, and all it took was a step of boldness, and God finally gave me all that I wanted. Courage is responding to what God wants me to do, no matter what it means for me. Here's the thing about courage. When God's calling you to be courageous and to step out in some way, oftentimes it's not gonna benefit you in the ways that you wanna be benefited. It's probably gonna make you look cooler, or get you more respect from people, it's not going to make you more comfortable to make you more money. Responding to Jesus, no matter what it means for me, means that there's probably still risk involved. To be courageous in following Jesus means, you know, I could lose something in this. The apostles in the first century church had weighed and measured the cost for themselves. They knew this is going to cost me everything, but I know that it's worth it. First Christians, the first century Christians, when Jesus told them, hey, follow me into the hard things, they responded, even knowing that it might get them killed. One of the saddest verses in the whole Bible, if you want to turn with me to Acts chapter 12, is something that happens so fast, but it's so full of, honestly, it's so full of sadness for me, just how quickly it all goes down, but it, I think it changes, if I was in the first century church, following Jesus at the time in the book of Acts, it would change the way I'm seeing what my call is. It would change the way we see our mission. Acts chapter 12, just a couple verses here. In verse one and two, it moves quick. Here's what happens. About that time, that time, whenever that time was, King Herod Agrippa began to persecute some believers in the church. He had the apostle James, John's brother, killed with the sword. And then it moves on to talk about Peter. In one verse, 
the apostle John, James, the apostle James gets killed and they just move on. That's so sad to me. I don't know if it's sad to you, but we're talking about James. We're talking about not just like, you know, God loves everybody. We're not talking about someone who's like unnamed, a part of the family. We know there's persecution at this time. We know people are being locked up. People are put in prison. People are even being killed. Stephen, the first martyr. This has happened before. But we're talking about James. If Jesus had some people who were close to him, it was the 12, the apostles. And within the 12, there are people who are even closer to him. You got Peter in there. You got John and you have James, like the closest people to Jesus in his ministry. And up to this point, yes, we've lost people. We know it's worth it. It's worth it. But now they've lost an apostle and it happens in just a verse. Imagine if you're standing at a time and you get the news, James has been killed. Probably at this point, you're like, well, Jesus told me we'd have hardship. But now it's so real. One of the people that was closest to Jesus, he's died too. This changes the whole paradigm for us. I have no idea what this is going to mean for me. And we, we see, if you follow throughout scripture and you look at historical books, you see that every single one of the apostles meet a similar fate to James. But they walked into it with their head high because they knew it was worth it. Living a life of courage means I step out no matter what it means for me. No matter what it means for me. And today, I think it's important for us to recognize, and we know probably following Jesus with courage today doesn't mean I know I'm literally going to lay down my life. In some places, it does mean that. For us in this room, however, who have a level of freedom and security where we know pretty confidently that's not going to happen to us, we still lack courage because I think actually in our affluent culture, our Western culture, the thing we actually fear more than our death or our loss of possessions is our loss of reputation. And I might know and recognize and and preach it, yeah, come on, courage is not foolishness, but courage means I'm willing to look foolish for the right reasons. And that, I think, for many of us is the thing that scares us the most. Courage means responding to Jesus no matter what it makes me look like. Our worst nightmare might be looking like a fool or someone's perspective of me was negative, and that's a horrible disaster in our mind. If I'm going to follow Jesus, I have to not be afraid to look foolish. If I'm going to follow Jesus, we might have some people in the room, and maybe I'm like you too. I might even say, hey, the big things that take boldness, I'll do it. Like, if tomorrow it's illegal to be a Christian in our nation, I'll stand before a ruler and a president or a king and be like, no, we're going to keep going. We're going to move forward. You might say, hey, if it comes to that, I'll be the guy to start a home church. We'll go underground. We'll still make it happen. I'll give up my life. I'll give up my money. I'll give up everything for the cause of Jesus. But right now, I'm too afraid to go talk to my neighbor. I'm too afraid to talk to strangers. It's so interesting how courage changes based on where we are. We might look at the big thing, the epic thing, and go, I'm willing to do that. But are you willing to do the small thing that takes a small amount of courage that could have a massive impact? You know what Peter and John were doing at the temple? They were going about their everyday life. They weren't doing anything extra special or extra crazy, looking for a fight or trying to go talk to somebody and change the world. They just decided, hey, there's a little moment right here. This person in front of us takes a little bit of courage to talk to this person and go, all right, I'll pray for you. And I don't even know if God's going to heal you, but I'm going to pray that he does. And in that small decision, it expanded. God did something beyond what they could possibly imagine. For us, we're not interested. I got to tell you, I don't think Jesus is totally interested in you being so excited or me being so excited to do the big thing. He wants us to step out and courage in the small thing. He wants us to step out of courage. Maybe just today, the conversation I don't want to have because it's going to be uncomfortable. He wants me to step out of my comfort zone today when my neighbor keeps talking about all the stuff that's going on in their family, but I'm not willing to talk to them because, well, that's uncomfortable. That's a little bit strange. God's asking us to take the small step of courage, and he's going to do something incredible. I have to first lay down my ego, my ego, my personal gain, and my want for comfort if I'm going to see God do incredible things through me. It's going to take courage. I want to leave us with a couple things today. How do we step out in these things? I want to give you two things. One, two is really quick. It's really nice. Write them down. If we want to step out in courage, how can we claim a lifestyle every single day of stepping out in courage and seeing what God's going to do? I think things we got to know. Number one, courage comes easier when you're in practice. 
Courage comes easier to us when we're in practice. Courage has to be exercised. We have to walk it out regularly. It's like a muscle that has to be flexed, that has to be grown. To live your life courageously is to put yourself in scenarios that scare you until they become more comfortable. Why are some of the small things so scary? It's because we're not used to doing them. One of the first steps to building a life of courage where I become more comfortable in some of those things is walking it out on a regular basis, putting yourself in uncomfortable spaces that'll help you handle it better. You might know some people who are really naturally more cool-headed, like in high-pressure scenarios. You might know somebody who's like, wow, when things really got crazy, they seem so focused, so level-headed, so sure of themselves. Actually, scientifically, experts will tell us that there are certain people who are more cool-headed in moments when like your adrenaline spikes. When you hit an adrenaline spike and you have this drive to either run away or fight back, and if you don't know whether you're gonna do either of them, your hands just kind of shake and like, you're like, your legs feel like jelly. These are ad adrenal spikes where adrenaline flows through your system. And they say that like, actually a way to be more focused in those moments so you don't feel this rush to run away or to fight back or just stand there and shake. If you're regularly put in high pressure scenarios, you become more adjusted to the feeling of your adrenaline flowing through your body and you become more cool headed, you become more focused, you can think more clearly. There's something to this. As you step out and do things that take a little bit of courage, you become more used to being in that space and you can become more focused, level-headed, and you can expand into the next place. If we're gonna be courageous people, I gotta ask you, how are we flexing our muscles in doing the courageous thing? How are you flexing your muscles to put yourself in uncomfortable situations that'll help you develop and grow into the bigger thing, the next thing, the next encounter? I can remember in college, I had a moment because I was studying to be a pastor. I was studying the Bible and you learn all about ministry and what God's doing around the world. But I realized one day I was like, I'm not really connecting to anybody outside of my school. And I can remember one night, it was unrelated, but you know, it was like a study night. It was like midnight. And I was like, you know what I could go for right now after all this studying? A McFlurry. That's all I want right now is a McFlurry, Oreo, only Oreo. I don't want the M&M stuff because they get like really frozen and cold and like breaks your teeth. I want an Oreo McFlurry right now. And at midnight, I, I drove to McDonald's and I was like, all right, I gotta get this McFlurry because I just need it, it's good for my soul. It may not be good for my body, but it's good for my soul and that matters, it's mental health, everybody. I can remember going through the drive-through and it hit me, it hit me again. What are you doing to reach people around you? And you're like, oh. I was like, here's what I'm gonna do. When this woman opens the window to take my money and give me my McFlurry, I'm gonna witness. I can remember pulling up to this drive through the window. I was like, I don't know, I'll just flex the muscle. I need to get out there. And she, she opened the window up. She said, hey, welcome to McDonald's. Four dollars or whatever it is for McFlurry. I gave her the money and I was ready to go to just witness to her because I know she's gonna get saved. I'm gonna share the good news. It's gonna change her life. And I, I go like this and she closes the window. I go, okay. No, she's gotta get my McFlurry. She'll be back. A couple minutes go by, she comes back, my receipt, my McFlurry, hands it out to me, and this is my moment. All right, I, I go like this, and she closes the window. I'm like, oh no. And I sat there, I'm not lying to you, I sat there for 30 seconds, and I was like, come on, just knock on the window, <laughs> get her back out here, because it's gonna change your life. And so I did, I sat there, and I knocked on the window, and she was like, why is this guy still sitting here? Why is he still here? She opens the window back up. I said, hey, so thanks for the McFlurry. I just wanted to tell you, I don't know, I don't know if you go to church anywhere, I just want to tell you that Jesus loves you. It was simple, it was easy. And in my mind I go like, wow, I just imagine what's going on in her life, what her home life is like, what she's going through on an everyday basis. Maybe she's been far from God for all this time and in this moment, she's gonna break down, she's gonna cry, she's gonna give her life to Jesus. And anticipating this moment, she stared back me in the face, looked me straight in the eyes and said, okay. <laughs> she closed the window, I drove away. I was like, nothing, nothing spiritual happened there. And listen, I don't know what this woman's really going through. I don't know what difference that might have made in her life. It may not have changed her life at all. Maybe it was a seed that led to something more. I don't know. But it did something for me. 
It was one of those small steps to get outside my comfort zone and go like, hey, I don't know whether I'm going to change the world at first. I don't know the first 74 times I pray for somebody's healing if it's going to happen. But if God's calling me to do it, I'm going to step out because I need to flex this muscle because he wants to change the world. And I can only do that. He can only do that through me if I'm willing and available to be uncomfortable. Are we flexing the muscle? It takes us outside our comfort zone. Can I challenge you today? I want to challenge you. Let me give you some homework. Nobody likes homework. I'll give you a challenge. Challenges are like, all right, I'm on. I'll dare you. I'm going to dare you today. When you're out at lunch this afternoon, take a minute. I'm daring you to do it. Double dare you. You got to do it. Whoever's waiting on you, waiter, waitress, spend a moment. You don't got to get them saved. There's no report back. I don't (laughs) don't know what's going to happen. Take a moment to listen to their story. Ask them questions about themselves. Even if it's a small thing, plant the seed. If you're uncomfortable, good, you're going to learn more from this. Talk to the waiter or the waitress this week. Look for a ministry opportunity. What does that mean? Somebody's going through something at work. I have a family member that's in trouble. Look for the ministry opportunity that takes you out of your routine. We're always moving somewhere. Look at the thing that's going to disrupt you on your path, that's going to make you late to the meeting, that's going to make you late to lunch, that's going to disrupt your normal routine. Recognize that's an opportunity from God and step into it. If we learn to do this on a regular daily basis, imagine what God's going to put in our hand. But all it takes, all it takes is a little bit of courage. I got one more. I got one more. We're going to wrap up in just a moment. I want to invite uh, our musician to come on up. Let's play some music with us. We're going to bring things down in a moment. Number one, I think if we're going to step out in this, we've got to know that courage comes easier when you're in practice. We need to practice. I think number two, courage comes easier when you know you're not alone. Courage comes easier when you know you're not alone. When you have somebody who's next to you, it gives you comfort. When you know that, hey, if I'm going to look like a fool or this isn't actually going to go the way I thought it was going to go, you know that they're right there with me and they're going to look weird too. It helps. When you get a little bit of like, all right, I can do this. When you got a friend who's going with you, you're like, all right, come in. We can do this. It'll work out. Nothing we're called to do in this life of following Jesus is supposed to be individual. But if you were to dream about your epic moment, the moment of boldness, the time you stepped out, the courageous encounter that you had, you usually think about you being the hero in the story, doing it all by yourself. Nothing we were called to was supposed to be that way. Jesus is the only hero of our story. We're just following him into the stuff that he already did. He's just showing us the way. Who are you walking with in your quest to be courageous? Who's by your side in this room or maybe it's a family member or it's a friend? Who are you walking with into the unknown? Who's by your side as you step out in courage? You look at the model of the apostles, they didn't go anywhere by themselves. Peter's got John and Peter's doing all the talking. He's just more of the talker, more of the extrovert. But John's right there the whole step. He's there the whole way. He's probably the behind the scenes ministry guy. Who are you walking with? Turn with me one more time. We're going back to Acts chapter four. This is after this whole encounter goes down. Peter and John go before the religious leaders and they get blasted. You can't do this anymore, guys. You're done. And they're like, okay. And they walk away and they're like, yeah, right. We're gonna be back here tomorrow. In chapter four, They don't just go home and write down on their blog all this epic stuff that happened. They go home to a community of friends and family and believers. In chapter four, verse 30, we're gonna pick up. What they do when they get back with the people, they immediately share the story and then all together, the whole community, they sit down and like, we're gonna pray that God does more more of this stuff. We're gonna pray that he give us courage, give us boldness to step out into places that are unknown or unsure or uncomfortable. And we want him to work through us. God, all we have to do is step out in courage and you're gonna take it from there. They pray all these things, God, you come through. And here's what they say in verse, in verse 30. God, stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And after this place, this prayer, the meeting place shook. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they preached the word of God with boldness. Courage comes easier when you do it with somebody. When you do it in a community and you step out with somebody. If you've got a challenge ahead of you, call your friend. Come on, you got to come with me. i got to talk to this person. 
or things are going down, I need someone to pray for healing. I need you to come with me. Who are you walking with? We have to do it with each other. And here's something that I think is beautiful in this verse as well. It's after they pray, God, would you give us boldness that the Holy Spirit comes and he fills them afresh. You know that you can be even more courageous when it's not just other people that are around you, but you know Jesus is walking with you. Courage comes way easier, even here in the verse 31, where as soon as they pray, the place is shaken. Could you imagine that today? As we pray for boldness and courage, the place shakes. The Holy Spirit comes down and it says what? It gives them boldness and it gives them courage to keep going. Courage comes way easier when you don't just know someone's by your side, but you know that Jesus has already gone before you. When you know that no matter where you go, it feels strange or it costs you everything, that Jesus is standing right by your side. We can walk courageously, I, I believe it, and I hope you do too. More than anything, we can walk courageously into whatever comes our way when we know that Jesus is standing right next to us in the process. We're gonna have a moment, I think, today. I wanna, I just have a prayer today that as we pray for courage today, that we have an experience like this. Wouldn't that be weird if like the place just started shaking? You're like, ah, that's, that's actually not cool. What a moment. But what I do pray is that God gives us courage and gives us boldness today. And as we enter that prayer moment, I actually, I wanna invite our, our ushers and our pastors to come on. We're gonna step into a moment of communion. And as our ushers and our pastors come and they begin to distribute, they're gonna give you a small piece of bread. I'm going to give you a small cup of juice. As you get that, would you just hold on to it? We're going to take it together in a few moments. I think the time of communion, I really believe this, it just lined up perfectly. I think the moment of communion is, more than anything, a call to God's people to be courageous because Jesus has already gone before you. If you know the story of the Last Supper, where Jesus sits down with his family, his disciples, the guys who have been with him for years. He'd been showing them the way, he'd been teaching them. They'd been stepping out into incredible things. They seen Jesus do the scariest things with the most incredible payoff. And he sits around the table with these guys and he says, so listen, you're gonna do this whenever you're together. And I want you to remember what I've done for you and what I've shown you. It's kind of an abnormal, kind of strange dinner where Jesus doesn't make it all comfortable and perfect. He calls people out. He says, Peter, you're going to deny me, man, three times. Jesus said, Peter says, no. Like, no, for real, you're going to do it. Judas, in the middle of the dinner, gets up and leaves because he got exposed as a traitor. But Jesus is doing something. He's like, you need to know that there's gonna be trouble ahead. This is what he's telling his disciples. You gotta know that this is gonna cost you everything. But know that every time you're together and you pray for boldness, because you're gonna need each other, that you can take bread in your hands, you can take wine or juice in your hands, and you can remember that when I ask you to walk into the terrifying thing, the unknown place that I've already gone before you, I've done all the hard work. And the Holy Spirit, my spirit, is gonna walk with you as you enter the unknown. These are the things I want us to remember this morning. I pray that this moment, as we take the bread and we drink the juice, that we remember what Jesus has done for us. Remember what he's done in the past, took all our sins away. He came back to life telling us we had a new one waiting for us too. At Pentecost, he gave his disciples the Holy Spirit. The task is yours now, I'm walking with you, but go do it. And we have that same spirit living inside of us. We know that God didn't just do things. Jesus just didn't do things in the past. He's doing things in us right now. And he has a beautiful vision for the future that he wants us to walk in. I'll encourage us just for a moment. I want us to take just a couple minutes in individual prayer for a moment. The Apostle Paul says, hey, this is a holy moment when we take communion together. 
because he knows this is a family thing and this is a thing between us and Jesus. He says, you don't want to take it in an unworthy manner. So I want us to just take a moment. Just one minute. Moment of prayer. Would you think back on all the things God's done for you? Would you turn your awareness to the things he's doing in you right now? And could you even bring to your mind the things you know right now God's asking you to step out and courage into, but you don't know if you can do it? Let's take a moment. Listen to the Spirit and listen to what he says to you. Jesus was betrayed he sits around the table with all of his friends, his family he takes bread in his hands he says, this is my body which is given for you that means what's true for us Jesus gave everything for us so that we could have everything in him that in mind, that glorious reality in mind, let's take the bread together. And Jesus took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. That means new covenant. We have a new beginning ahead of us that even if it costs us everything now, we have a glorious future that's waiting for us. And we drink a cup because that's reason to celebrate, amen? With that in mind, let's drink together. Jesus, we thank you. God, we just, we just pray even right now. In the spirit of boldness, in Acts chapter four, God, we just ask today, as we remember what you've done through us, what you've done for us, what you're doing now, what you have in the future. God, would you give us boldness and faith like never before. God, would you speak to us right now, give us the face of the person you want us to reach. Give us the time to step out. Give us somebody who's gonna be right next to us, the friend who will walk with us into the unknown. God, remind us every day that you've been here from the start and you will not leave. God, give us boldness today. Give us faith today. Speak to us, work through us. Help us to step out in the small moment of courage, knowing there's something beautiful on the other side. We love you, we praise you, we worship you, and we will not stop. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Can I invite you for a moment? This is a moment to praise. Would you stand your feet with me? And can we sing this out together? Oh, no.